going to continue my discussion on God's Word before and after 1611. This is part five. I'm going to focus on the English language, but I will comment on other languages in future presentations. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about the subject matter of Egypt rising. I am excited to present this because I think it's going to really open up the discernment of those saved people and show them some vocabulary that the Holy Spirit teaches out of the pure Word of God. That said, please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles. I'm going to read out of the book of Jeremiah, chapter 46, verse 8. Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Very powerful prophecy that we all need to take heed of. So today the purpose for this particular sermon lesson is, who is Egypt? I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to mention some counter-reformation tactics because I'm continuing the discussion on God's Word after 1611. Discernment, who has it? You know, I get a lot of comments uh, from people about, well, they believe this Bible or they believe that Bible or whatever, and that's fine. I always tell people, follow the Lord, don't follow men, don't put confidence in men. We will all give an account for our beliefs at judgment someday. But there is discernment, and that discernment hugely and wildly varies depending on the Bible you have and whether or not you're even saved. So I'm going to talk about discernment, who has it. It's kind of a litmus test for are you saved, and if so, are you uh, feeding on an unbroken testimony and discerning what the Holy Spirit is teaching you, or are you learning from the precepts of men? And then I'm going to talk about the invisible flood. This is a very important topic uh, to fit in with the Egyptian theme today, the invisible flood, because this is a, a pretty significant teaching in God's Word, and I'm going to comment further on that. So first and foremost, who is Egypt? It says in Revelation chapter 11, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. God is simply defining Egypt as Babylon. They're spiritually equivalent. This is for saved people that no longer have natural minds, but have spiritual discernment. We all know where Jesus was literally crucified, but where were the spiritual powers behind the crucifixion? Was it Rome? Was it uh, under the Babylonian emperor? Was that the spiritual power and the spiritual wickedness uh, behind the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? In Ezekiel chapter 29 it says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which had said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. This is linked to other parts of Scripture, of course. And it's important that we recognize Egypt as Babylon because the Lord is also teaching us that he's speaking to the king of Babylon, the dragon. And then in Revelation chapter 12, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So when we use precept upon precept, scripture interpreting scripture, we get a really solid idea of the importance of identifying Egypt with Babylon, which ultimately represents the world of unsaved people that are being ruled ultimately by the god of this world, Lucifer, Satan, the devil. So I just wanted to comment on that, this because this is a foundational teaching that needs to be laid before I proceed here. Babylon, Egypt, spiritually equivalent to Egypt, like God's people, 
Babylon is portrayed in a masculine and a feminine sense. Uh, in a masculine sense, there's a couple of examples I'm going to give. In Job chapter 20, it says, He shall suck the poison of asp, the viper's tongue shall slay him. Spiritually, God is talking about Babylon in a masculine sense, describing a body of people as a man uh, that is feeding on corrupt doctrine. And ultimately, Lucifer is casting doubt on the word of God, and they just never get over the doubt that's in their heart. That's a spiritual lesson that is discerned by people that have been born again. In Job chapter 27, it says, Terrors take hold on him as waters. A tempest stealeth him away in the night. So God is continuing his lesson on Babylon in a masculine sense and describing how the waters are going to be a terror. And there's other lessons in scripture about how unsaved people just can't recognize floods. And God is talking about spiritual things. Uh, Babylon in a feminine sense, just like the bride of Christ is described uh, as feminine, obviously. Babylon has a feminine identification. Uh, in Job chapter 49, it says her young ones, which are later revealed to be Jerusalem and Samaria, apostate Protestantism. Her young ones also suck up blood, which is doctrine, and where the slain are, there is he. So this links directly into the teaching that the Holy Spirit gave us out of Job chapter 20. God is just completing our understanding that if you suck corrupt doctrine, if you're feeding on corruption, uh, you're going to die in your iniquity, and you're ultimately slain by the viper, who is Lucifer, that serpent. In Revelation chapter 17, it says, And the woman, referring to Babylon, which thou sawest, is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this woman is also described as a city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And um, we know that the city is spiritually Sodom and Egypt, a city and a country that sits on seven mountains. Okay, so we can use that edification from the Most High to ultimately identify, as Christians have throughout the ages, Babylon. So I'm going to comment on the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. The Reformation happens when God brings the church together through the power of his word. He sends the Holy Spirit to true believers that have an unbroken testimony and do not... Um, he doesn't want a spirit of slumber to be sent to people, so the scripture cannot be broken. You have to believe on Jesus Christ and not trust men. There is always a counter-reformation going on because this world is ruled by Satan as God allows it to be. Satan is described, Lucifer, as the God of this world. Jesus Christ is not of this world. He's the Most High. So, after 1611, uh, there are... Uh, a number of different confusion tactics made, uh, one of them being, well, we can't be sure what the true 1611 Bible is, so there's alternate text presented. I happened to go to the British Library and saw uh, the third uh, 1611 Bible ever printed and talked with the curators extensively, uh, having private time with them before the public was welcomed in, and certainly... Uh, saw the true 1611 text as I spent time comparing it to uh, other 1611 Bibles. And so one tactic of confusion is create alternate text so that no one can ever believe anything. And that's pretty much the world we live in today. Have you ever met anyone that is ready to die for an every word testimony that believes we have an every word Bible? I would suggest there's very, very few people like that. Uh, another tactic is, and as I talked about previously, um, England is gifted with an Egyptian manuscript, the Alexandrinus. Well, that screams Babylon to a born-again believer. So Babylon is coming for e uh, England because you just can't have faith in an unbroken testimony and have a Babylonian powerhouse reign over the kings of the earth, so you, you have to kill the faith of people. 
So the, the one of the first major things that was done is the Alexandrinus manuscript, which is Egyptian, uh, named after Alexandria, Egypt, is gifted to England uh, after King James dies. Okay, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, is very Rome friendly at that time. So it sets the stage for England to start losing their faith in the Word of God, which uh, over the centuries has seemed to have been not completely, but mostly lost. Okay, and then notably in 1769, the 1611 text undergoes a fourth major revision uh, by a guy named Benjamin Blaney, who thinks it references both the Vatican manuscript as well as the Alexandrinus manuscript as having great credence or uh, importance as far as the Word of God, and he references both in his private work uh, in in translating the Old Testament, uh, as I will talk about uh, coming up. And then you've got uh, a gradual change over the text. The text was changed by Blaney, who at the time really didn't know any Hebrew and didn't believe that the traditional received text was the Word of God, so he's leaning towards the Egyptian text and then we've got Jesuit ongoing infiltration into the Christian churches in the later 1800s. Before I get to that, got a guy that says he's a Protestant discovering an Egyptian manuscript in Egypt. His name is Tischendorf, but a year before he discovers it, he's meeting privately with the Pope. That screams Babylonian infiltration to me. And then you've got these guys, Westcott and Hort, uh, who are using Tischendorf's text as a basis, and they're coming up with a completely different Bible that is in huge alignment with the Roman Catholic text. It's called the English Revised Version, which was completed in 1885, and that text is similar to nearly all modern Bibles today, uh, heavily influenced from the Vatican and Synodic manuscripts, i.e. Egyptian manuscripts. So, in the meantime, you've got all this Babylonian encroachment on the Christian community. Hardly anyone is pushing back on this. And you've got many, many, many Bibles now leaning on the Egyptian text rather than the received text. And here we are today where the best of the KJV community identifies this 1769 text as the Word of God in its refined state. Well, that's fine. Go through it, spend a couple years, examine it, compare it to the 1611, and pray and fear and tremble and cry and ask the Lord to show you the truth. That would be my comment. Okay? Uh, so, being raised Catholic and being a Christian now, most importantly, having the Holy Spirit in me, I, I can clearly see now that the Word of God has been fulfilled there is nearly a complete desolation on the earth, and when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith. Is there anyone that's going to believe anything related to the Word of God? Do we have a pure testimony? Where is the faith? Faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Jesus Christ himself is asking, when he cometh, shall he find it? So we are seeing a fulfillment of that. I'm going to comment more about Benjamin Blaney. He referenced the Vaticanus manuscript as an authority in some of his published work on recreating books of the Bible, such as Jeremiah and Lamentations. He also noted observations from the Alexandrinus manuscript. In his 1769 work, Blaney sometimes used different words. He departed from the correct ones used in the 1611 presented to King James. Did he do this to apparently fit his preferred context? I've commented on this before. Uh, when were these words first tampered with by others? I talk about some notable changes in the Hebrew that Blaney had no understanding of in Ruth chapter 3, verse 15. It's vital that we know Boaz goes to the city first before Ruth does. Vital for prophecy in the Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 7. We must know that there's a drunk woman in the arms of the man. Vital for prophecy. And in Job 39, verse 30, 
we must know who is being slain by the viper. It's the horse leech, okay? And she is feminine. She's not committing suicide. Blaney changed or continued with changes to God's word from a seven-year, 47-man effort finished in 1611. So whoever Blaney was associated with, they usurped the authority of the 1611 committee, and there was certainly Egyptian influence there. Okay, that's irrefutable. Many other changes were made that have been accepted today. These changes have killed the prophets. Why do you think there's no discernment in our Christian community today? Is there a spirit of slumber as Jesus Christ teaches us in Matthew chapter 25 and also the book of Romans? I can't remember if it's Romans chapter 11, but the table has been made a snare. Where you feed will reflect the discernment that you have, and all of us are going to be judged by what comes out of our mouths. God does not allow any changes to the word. I believe the Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. And he's not subject to the preferences of men's hearts. God is not subject to our contextual understanding of things. If the Bible doesn't make sense, like a man's breasts are filled with milk, but if that's the correct Hebrew, then we have to fear and tremble and translate it, it, it correctly until the Holy Spirit teaches us what is going on at a spiritual level because natural men do not receive these things. So I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, Blaney being a textual critic, uh, we got a guy named Bruce Metzger who worked, he was a friend of Jesuit Carlo, Cardinal Carlo Martini, fellow Nestle Alain Greek committee member who uh, partnered with the Jesuit priest on making uh, a text that underlies nearly all modern Bibles we have today. You can read what I say there, but Metzger strangely, strangely you know, kind of applauds the Blaney version as the most careful and comprehens comprehensive revision that came to be known as the authorized version. So Metzger doesn't believe in the Word of God, but he's paying lip service to Blaney. And people trust him. Why? Because they don't prove their armor. None of us are like David. David would not take armor into battle because he had not proved it. So we need to take a lesson from David and not buy into the precepts of men, not take armor unless we have proven it. If you don't know how to prove your armor, ask God to show you. Okay? Um, so Metzger is a guy that's working side by side with the Jesuit priest. Uh, is Metzger as Catholic as the Pope? That's a question for people to ponder. But uh, a powerful tactic of deception is saying, oh, I'm a Protestant, but let me work on this text that strangely will align with Egypt or Babylon. Uh, and then he writes in several of the intros of modern Bibles that the KJV has grave defects. So he comes out and admits that he doesn't believe in the KG, KJV Bible, but he's already incorrectly described it to people as the 1769 text. Why is that? Could it be that the true 1611 is the most hated book in the world? Is this why I have been attacked numerous times and other people that I know that identify the 1611 Bible as the pure word of God have had attacks as well? Something to think about. The persecution will follow all that live godly in Christ Jesus. Discernment. Who has it? There could be an endless debate on, well, I prefer this text, or this scholar says this is the best, or the publisher, you know, says that this is the best Bible, blah, blah, blah. Discernment, who has it? Ultimately, you need not that any man teach you. It's the Holy Spirit that will lead us to all truth. He will testify of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be a Christian and to understand the counsel of Jesus Christ is being taught by the Holy Spirit, and then you can edify one another. Um, if you're born again, based on your spiritual gifts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about discernment. First of all, if Egypt is rising as a flood, we know that God is talking about Babylon. What is a flood? Well, a flood is made up of water. A well, water is symbolic of truth, whether it's God's truth or man's truth, pure water or miry water. A wave would be uh, a, a reaction of water, the truth, and if it's not God's truth, you don't have peace. So if you're a raging wave, full, foaming out your own shame, as it says in the book of Jude, 
That's a restless person in apostasy and strife. That's a heathen. A whale is uh, symbolic of Leviathan, Pharaoh, or Antichrist, the Pope. Okay. Bars, as I've talked about in, in recent uh, sermons, are the prison, the iron, the corruption, the contentions against the word of God. And, and uh, a bed is where people slumber. Uh, it's a Bible or an idol. If it's a Bible and it has oil in it, if it's a lamp with oil but the scripture's broken, you got a spirit of slumber. See Matthew chapter 25, although you'll get into the kingdom of heaven. But if you don't have oil in that lamp, uh, you're going to be in a spirit of slumber and you're going to die in your iniquity. Behemoth is Satan, Lucifer, the god of this world. Um, as I've talked about. And his bones, his scriptures, are as bars of iron. They keep people in a spiritual prison. Now I'm going to stop and pause and ask the, you know, people can reflect on what their discernment is. I'm sharing you what the Holy Spirit teaches out of the 1611, which is, again, it's just not a, a Bible that the world tolerates. You know, give us the KJV, give us the Geneva, Give us anything but the 1611 has been my personal experience. Great city is Babylon, Rome, Nineveh, Egypt, Sodom, Tyrus, etc. Hail, hard truths of God's word. It hurts when the truth hits you. Uh, and hail is made of water. Hair is covering. Hands would be representative of deeds or works. Uh, harlot is a false church. Spiritually, Sodom or Egypt, uh, you can see a picture of the Vatican there and a picture of uh, the, the pyramids and uh, Pharaoh, uh, spiritually equivalent to each other. Lamp is a word, whether it's a singular lamp coming out of the mouth of the Lord, thy word is a lamp, or whether it's many lamps coming out of the mouth of Antichrist, as it says in Job chapter 41, verse 19, uh, I think Revelation chapter 8, somewhere around verse 10, is another reference there. Leviathan would be Antichrist or Pope, Pharaoh, etc. Mark would be a spiritual seal of acknowledgement. Merchandise would be Bibles or idols. Scales would be pages of those Bibles. C would be masses of people in society, restless in their unsaved ways. A shadow would represent wisdom or days. A ship would be a Bible or idol. Silver would be understanding or symbolic of the word of God. Or, if it's got dross in it, corrupt words. Um, just a slide here to talk about synonyms. Blood, water, spirit, fire, Holy Ghost. Yeah, blood is symbolic of the word of God, as you can see in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, water is also symbolic of the Word of God, uh, as you can read there from Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, spirit is representative of the Word of God. Uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost to record the Word. Um, so uh, we can read more about that in Titus chapter 3. Fire represents the Word of God, as it says in Jeremiah chapter 23. And the Holy Ghost is the Word of God, according to 1 John chapter 5, bears witness in earth. Uh, so you can read that, but it's important that we understand synonyms because there is a counterfeit to all of these. There's a bad type of blood. There's a bad type of water, miry water, uh, uh, blood that is uh, shed of the prophets. Uh, there's a spirit of Antichrist. There's a fire, a lake of fire, ultimately, and then there's a counterfeit to the Holy Ghost. We've got devils on the earth. So everything has a counterfeit because Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. Discernment, who has it? Uh, with regards to Leviathan, uh, you know, common teachings. If you go and you interview a hundred people who profess to be Christians, my personal experience is at least 99 of them, at least, when you ask them about Leviathan, they'll explain that it's, you know, a crocodile or maybe a whale or a dinosaur or a monster of chaos. Whatever they read in their margins, um, has God taught them spiritually what Leviathan is? Leviathan, spiritually, is the Antichrist in the 1611 Bible. 
and I just put some cross references here where as we read scripture scripture interprets scripture and you get a lot of the same teachings in your spiritual mind that God refreshes your your understanding as you study your Bibles you not only read but you study your Bibles so here is a, a just a, a small sampling of references there the invisible flood is the last thing I want to talk about God, when he destroyed the earth back in Genesis chapter 6, he certainly said that he'll never destroy the earth in that way again. However, the devil wants to be like the Most High. Now, God's not going to allow the devil to put a physical flood to destroy the entire world, but there is another lesson in Scripture that we can take from this, and it's what I will call the invisible flood. In Revelation chapter 12, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, if you're a Christian and you're reading with the spiritual mind and you have spiritual understanding, you know that the serpent, his job is to cast doubt on the word of God. We just I just talked about the water is symbolic of the word of God, the washing of the water of the word. So, the devil has bad miry water coming out of his mouth and he wants to carry people away in the imagination of their hearts you know behemoth is a hippopotamus or a water horse as some of the finest most well-respected protestant scholars have decreed and they're men of respect respected by the pastors of the churches last week i mentioned one of them his name was john gill very well respected man uh, uh, behemoth is the water horse according to him where is that coming from? Is it a coincidence that the visible Antichrist of the Church of Satan also teaches that? You know, something for people to think about and pray. In Proverbs chapter 18, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. If you don't have God's wisdom, you've got men's wisdom, which is miry, corrupt water coming out of your mouth. And you're defiled by that. What comes out of our mouths defiles us. So the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. So if you've got a flood, you've got deep water. And Lucifer is described as the man who, who I think in Isaiah chapter 14, is this not the man who, you know, deceived the entire world? I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I'm going from memory. But this is another cross-reference to how God teaches us spiritual things. Uh, and uh, we know that the serpent wants to carry away the believers in Jesus Christ or those that profess to believe okay in Daniel chapter 11 it says and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and gold which are also idols idolatrous false testimonies corrupt water a flood Egypt is Babylon so God is talking about how people will be carried away in their imagination of their hearts because of their beliefs, uh, their lack of faith in his word, and their idolatry is how they're going to get carried away. All as a result of corruption, because his bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are as bars of iron. Iron is corrupt, and it causes rust, and God rebukes this rust in James chapter uh, 5, I believe it is. In Ezekiel chapter 32, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the seas. And thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and followest their rivers. Uh, very simple for me. I'm getting spiritual vocabulary. I know that feet are symbolic of people. Uh, the devil uses his antichrist to decree his false teachings. Um, you know, we recognize that antichrist is also described as a whale in scripture. His name is Leviathan, and he is basically being fed doctrine from Lucifer, behemoth. Uh, and then in Psalm 104, it says, There go the ships, there is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. In other words, the Antichrist is operating with these false corrupt testimonies. As I mentioned, ships are symbolic of Bibles or idols. 
So on a spiritual level, we're getting taught some great things to recognize the invisible flood today that's going on. And we don't need to cleave to the literal only understanding of the professing heathen world of, Christ, of so-called Christians. What we need to do is have faith in Jesus Christ, get an unbroken testimony, and ask God to teach us his word by faith. That's what we all need. In Matthew chapter 24 it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Okay, so God is telling us that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Does anybody believe that? This is coming from Jesus Christ. So my comment here would be, that if you have a false Christ, you have a false counsel through false prophets when the word is corrupted. So in Genesis chapter 3, we're told the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Lucifer is going to come at us with subtlety, according to God, and subtlety in a way that men don't really understand. So a false Christ results from a corruption in a Bible, changing one word, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Has it worked? Where is the discernment? Where is the faith in this world? Does anyone have faith? These are questions that I'm not asking. Jesus Christ is asking. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith? So real Christianity is wildly different than what the world teaches. And the real Jesus Christ and the real Word of God is wildly different than what the world teaches. And we're all going to give an account for every idle word that we have spoken in our lives. Every idle word. None of us are going to escape judgment. The few that are saved are going to have fire try our works and we will suffer loss because we lacked faith and did not build our works on gold, silver, and precious stones. But rather, the precepts of Babylon, wood, hay, and stubble. But those that never get saved and die in their iniquity will have a fiery judgment at the great white throne and their levels of damnation and punishment are going to be assigned to them based on their works. And Jesus Christ is the judge. And his word judges. And the saints shall judge the world because we have the word of God written in our foreheads. In Exodus chapter 7, it says, And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stunk, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. So if you have a spiritual mind, let's understand that God is talking about Babylon here, not just literal Egypt, but there's a spiritual lesson. Remember that Jesus says, Be fishers of men, so a fish and a man are spiritual equivalents, Rivers would be miry water, corrupt doctrine, and uh, the stink doesn't send up a sweet-smelling savor to God because people are dying in their idolatry. So um, the blood is symbolic of corrupt doctrine. So we're learning in Exodus chapter 7 that history is going to repeat itself. The same thing happens over and over and over. People die in their iniquity through corrupt, miry belief. They can't believe in God, so they put their trust in a false deity or men. And this is all something that God taught us literally out of Exodus, but sets up a spiritual lesson for the Babylonian world that we live in, and it repeats itself over and over and over throughout time. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, we've got a Babylonian religion reigning over the kings of the earth, reigning supreme, uh, world leaders, Christian leaders, all under their power if they're not true Christians. Okay? Once you become a true Christian and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, if you follow God, you follow Jesus Christ, you'll have all power over the enemy. 
but if not, you have no chance. So uh, we've got spiritual wickedness in high places. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not intelligent people that we're up against. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. And the only way to overcome that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit from him. Okay? And that way we've got power over all power of the enemy. But without that, there is no chance. So we need the whole armor of God. Don't let anybody beguile you. Uh, prove your armor. You need an every word testimony. Don't let the world kill your faith because that's what the world does. And be ready to account. All of us will give an account for every idle word that we say. And whatever word is written in our foreheads and whatever we believe the word of God to be, we're all going to give an account for that. So none of us are going to escape judgment, even the saved few. Our works are going to be tried based on our faith. Faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Thank you guys for watching this presentation. I sincerely hope that this gave some additional understanding to the subject matter of Egypt and Babylon and how the world has killed the faith, especially after 1611, once God's word was put into English once and for all, the decimation of faith has happened, and the world is involved in an invisible flood.